Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Glass Room. Um, this is our events program, which takes place uh, almost every night here at The Glass Room. And it gives us a chance to delve deeper into the exhibits that you see here and to bring your voices into the conversation as well. So um, we want to hear your questions. Um, when we were curating this exhibition for, the San for San Francisco, we really wanted to bring in some of the really explosive topics that are coming up in tech, and one of those big ones was content moderation. And we were looking for artists who make work around this theme, and there's literally one artwork about content moderation, and it was on loan to another exhibition. So I thought, how can we do this, and how can we discuss this topic, which is so important, and who better to invite than basically like the world's expert in commercial content moderation who's done so much research into this subject. She's talked to content moderators. She's written a book about it called Behind the Screen, in the shadow, uh, Content Moderation in the Shadows of Social Media. Um, she's a professor at UCLA, and she's also the co-founder of the Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, which I'm told is also called C2I2, with Sophia Noble. Um, so I'm really happy that Sarah Roberts is here to talk to us today about this incredibly important subject. So please welcome Sarah Roberts. Thank you. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Whenever I'm on the mic, I feel like, um, so I just got in from LA, you know, like doing some comedy. Um, but I almost didn't get in from LA. Any LA people here tonight? Yeah, I was in um, like traffic from a car wreck today, so that was a little dicey. But I'm so glad to be here. Um, I think we need to switch over to this input, if we could. Thank you. Wow, just like magic. That's how technology works. Um, uh, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. It was a pleasure to uh, be asked by Tactical Tech, and uh, particularly by you, Christy Lang, for um, extending the invitation to me. The glass room installation has been getting so much fanfare from people I know and respect, so it was really a thrill to be invited. Um, so I just want to uh, give my thanks to all who who are making this particular uh, space possible. And I was really thrilled to see all the traffic that has come through here today. So there's something about the moment that it's very compelling for passers-by to, to, to come visit. Um, tonight, as you said, I'm going to just share out with you uh, what really is the culmination of about uh, over nine years of, of work on what was at one time a pretty unknown uh, phenomenon, and that is the, uh, the industrial scale organized and for pay content moderation of social media. Um, I've been looking at this since, since uh, 2010, and I can tell you that um, you know, where we are today is something like this. You know, uh, it's not hard to open up any particular publication. It doesn't have to be tech specific, but certainly the tech journalists are on this beat pretty hard, as well as other mainstream news organizations who are very, very curious, interested in, uh, and, and are covering as a major portion of, of their work that they do as journalists, uh, the tech industry, and particularly the policies and, uh, and phenomena that are related to the ways in which social media content is generated and then the decisions that go into its circulation and its consumption online. So if I had to uh, put my finger on why this has become something of a hot issue, I think uh, it's clear that there have been some really significant political shifts in uh, some major places. And I should also say that tonight I'm going to focus my remarks on uh, the mainstream kind of major players in the industry emanating from this part of the world. So the Bay and a little south from here. Uh, that's my area of expertise. Um, 
And I think uh, these firms have been affected in so many ways, as well as many would argue have affected themselves, uh, the current political situation that we see in places like United States, Great Britain, uh, there are, uh, of course, Brazil comes to mind as another kind of hot spot. We've seen Myanmar uh, in the news. So all of these, uh, these political situations that have had this dimension uh, related to social media and content that circulated on it. And so um, by sort of uh, reverse engineering from, from the consumption of that material, I think the media have uh, rightly gotten very interested in asking more pointed and difficult questions to firms about the, the internal policies and decisions that go into uh, what is both allowed and what is rescinded from view. But prior to the past couple years, um, it was really a different sort of moment that we were living in, as many of you probably lived through. I, I, I venture to guess that, unlike my usual audience of um, you know, grad students and <laughs> folks like that, we might have a few people who work in industry with us tonight. You don't need to um, out yourselves. Some of my best friends work in industry, so it's fine. I talk to a lot of lawyers, too. Some of my best friends are lawyers, so it's fine. Um, but you may remember the days before uh, 2016 when things were really quite different in terms of what was permissible and what the uh, orientation was with regard to firms and how they were engaging with media. In, in other words, I would argue that they were really driving the narrative, and I think there's been a, a significant uh, change since that time. But what I really want to do is take us all the way back and, and take you through uh, sort of the genesis of my own research process to also hopefully take you along the trajectory of the development of what in 2010 was a nascent and really unknown uh, uh, sort of uh, in many ways unimagined phenomenon that has grown into uh, one of the uh, one of the key aspects that uh, perturbs so many in industry now, and I can tell you I know of one, uh, one particular Valley CEO who told his staff that uh, this was their billion dollar problem to solve. I think that's probably a very conservative number, <laughs> to say the least. But that, that was, you know, as of 2017. So let's go back to uh, 20, 2010, which to me doesn't seem like that long ago, but I guess it kind of is now, right? Uh, I was, uh, at the time, I was doing a PhD in information science at the University of Illinois. I know we have somebody here who uh, is a U of I grad. Um, if you don't know that part of the United States, University of Illinois, it's in this, this place called Urbana-Champaign. It's basically 80,000 people, small town, surrounded by cornfields on all sides. Uh, it's very agricultural. And uh, it's, it's a kind of a land-grant public institution. But also, it's the birthplace of things like uh, NCSA Mosaic. So that might be important to this crowd here. Uh, and uh, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications in general is located there. So there's a lot of good work that has come out of that university. So I was sitting um, in, the, kind of in the midst of this um, you know, really bad spot for anyone with hay fever, basically, in the middle of the cornfield. And I was, uh, I was on break, I was, I was drinking a coffee, and I was reading the New York Times, uh, and I came across this article that was basically what we would call a, a, a below-the-fold article. You know, it was in the text section, it was within the paper, it wasn't even on the top part of that section. And it was about a group of workers who were laboring in nearby agricultural Iowa. So more cornfields, or actually in this case, probably soy, soybean fields and pig farms. Uh, that's what's going on in my mind when I think of, of Iowa. And to my surprise, what these people were doing, according to this New York Times article, was that they were working in what, for all intents and purposes, sounded like call centers. They were working in big warehouse environments uh, in these rural parts of Iowa, so they weren't even in like any of the major cities. They were sort of on the outskirts. And uh, they were working for, in one case, this company called Calaris. You know, typical meaningless, um, made up name of, of kind of a corporate entity, right? That company has switched hands many times. So I always tell students and others, make sure you take a screenshot, right? That's, that's a, a free tip for tonight. Um, and what these workers were doing in this call center environment was, in fact, not answering phones, 
but as far as I could tell, they were working as some sort of third-party intermediaries for a variety of social media companies as well as pretty much any other uh, web-based maybe retail kind of uh, a website or any other concern that really had basically an opportunity for people to upload user-generated content. Uh, and they were screening that content against the norms and rules that were developed by the parties that needed the screening, right? So those were the companies dictating those rules to this third party, and these individuals at these uh, call center-like environments were then following those and making their adjudication decision based on those norms developed by the firms that needed their work. Um, this was kind of a funny activity to think about uh, going on in, in central Iowa, as I sat in central Illinois. And so, you know, I clicked over to the Calaris homepage, and um, let me tell you, I, I almost fell out of my chair because here's th this told me everything I needed to know about what Calaris was really selling. Their tagline was outsourced to Iowa, not India. Um, you know, nothing like a little subtle xenophobia to uh, sell your, your uh, cultural capital product, right? Uh, in other words, um, come to Calaris, uh, hire our group of workers who I'm going to go out on a limb and say probably look like could be my second cousins or, you know, some family members of mine. I'm from Wisconsin. I'm just going to let you know I'm from the Midwest. It's fine. We're corn-fed, salt-of-the-earth people. It's fine. Um, you know, what, what Calaris was advertising to and, and soliciting from these companies that needed their content moderation was, in fact, these intangible uh, values that they would argue were intrinsic to the workers that they were offering and lacking lacking in their Indian counterparts. And so in this way, a couple things happened. First of all, I realized in that moment that I had stumbled on uh, the, the organized for pay and, and also outsourced or third party um, function of content moderation as a, as a profession or a job. Uh, and I realized that um, in many of the other ways that uh, economic and geographic reconfigurations have been going on for a variety of reasons in the last few decades here again was another one where in fact if we follow the logic of the type of work that's on offer, it actually could make sense for central Iowa and erstwhile agricultural part of the country to be in direct competition with people who were probably in major megalopolises in India. Um, now, here's another thing I tell uh, early stage researchers and others. Um, you know you found something important when you can't stop telling your friends about it. So that's what I started doing. And I should tell you, um, although I was a, you know, a, an early career graduate student at the time, I'd had my own 15-year career in IT at that point. Uh, so I had come back to school thinking I was just going to get a master's degree and get out, and I ended up quitting my full-time job uh, in project management and going back um, full-time. And at this time, this is 2010, I myself had been on the internet since 1993, uh, predating uh, the widespread adoption of the graphical web. And, and in fact, the first time I saw uh, NCSA Mosaic on a bunch of Mac Quadras at the job that I had, I told my friend, well, that'll never take off. Everyone knows the internet is a text-based medium. In other words, there's no content. Who wants to look at that? Um, so that's why I work at a university and um, never got rich in any of the booms that all my friends came out to San Francisco and work in throughout the 90s. In fact, they used to email me, and I would check, you know, my, my shell, Unix shell account, Pine, whatever, come out to the Bay, come work here with us. And I was like, I got to finish this BA in French literature. Just let, like, let me do it. All right. This is, this is a cautionary tale. Um, so that was my background, you know, and, and, and I give it to you just to say that while this was a totally new phenomenon to me, this notion of organized, for-pay, third-party companies um, filling such a need. Uh, it wasn't like I was a total naive, right? Like, I, I, uh, I had pretty wide understanding of, I thought, of the internet ecosystem at that time, uh, having kind of come back from my, uh, from, from my miss on the graphical internet. 
Uh, and so when I realized that I had never really heard a lot about this practice, I hadn't heard a lot of solicitations. Obviously, this is like a business-to-business -business solicitation. This isn't aimed at regular consumers. Um, I had, certainly hadn't heard social media firms talking about the need for this kind of practice. Uh, and I hadn't heard all of my esteemed professors or my really smart uh, peers at school talk about it either. So I started going around and sort of like informally surveying everyone. And I said, hey, I read this article. First of all, I emailed it to everyone. OK, so we started with that. Everybody, did you read it? Yeah, we read it, Sarah. I said, OK, well, wh what do you think of that? And two to one, every single person I asked said two things. The first thing they said was, huh. I never thought about that. I never thought about the kind of problem that there must be in terms of liability or brand management for these companies to just open up their, their sites to anybody. And then they would take a pause and they'd say, but don't computers do that? Don't computers handle that? Guess what, in 2010, they certainly did not. Um, but I wanted to be sure. So I went over to NCSA Mosaic, or to NCSA, and I went over to a guy who had a, a computer vision lab there at the time, a research scientist. And I kind of walked into his lab, and you know, it was like a cube, bl blacked out cube, where you can control all the parameters in the room, and he's running a variety of different um, tests and experiments in there with his tech. And I sort of sketched out very briefly the issue I was interested in, and he, he listened, he kind of nodded along, and he gestured at this like oak table that was in the middle of the room. And he said, see that? And I said, yeah. He said, right now we're working on the computer kind of reliably knowing that that table is a table. Um, this is when he's controlling every parameter in the room. The table is a giant oak table. It's totally static. It's a fairly simple object, right? We didn't really get into philosophical questions about what it meant to know. That would have been an interesting conversation, but I wasn't really there yet. But this is 2010, okay? So uh, that kind of response from a researcher at NCSA let me know that wherever the tech was at the time to do automated um, computer vision based uh, uh, content moderation at scale and in a production kind of context, it wasn't there yet. And we can talk about where it is now. Maybe some of you can share where it is if you want. And you're probably not allowed, it's fine. I'm just trying to. All right. So where did that, where did that leave me? Well, it led me to, to here, to commercial content moderation. And, and I call it commercial content moderation very, very deliberately. Because going back to my own sort of like old school experience on the internet, tech space mostly, okay, but also early graphical web and so on, uh, those of us who were around in those days, we know that there's always been intervention, there's always been interference, there's always been adjudication of content, so-called content, material online in various, uh, in various guises on the, in these communities that we may have been a part of. Sometimes those... Uh, those, those kinds of uh, global governance decisions in a given community were laissez-faire, almost anarchic, right? Like anything goes. Anybody ever been on Usenet? Some of the old school Usenet? Yeah, right? I mean, that was kind of like a free-for-all sometimes. By, by, by contrast, some of those sites were incredibly, um, I, I guess I would say draconian or authoritarian in, in their rule sets. Uh, I used to frequent a, a, a little BBS that was literally run out of a dude's closet in Iowa City. Um, he didn't like what you posted, he'd delete it. That was just the rules of engagement. But see, we all knew that. We all knew it up front, and we knew that that intervention was going on. Uh, the many people who used to engage in that kind of intervention, and, and in some cases still do on sites like Wikipedia or Reddit, did so voluntarily. It was probably a self-organized group of people, and again, it could run the gamut from, from very disorganized to, to very, uh, uh, very complex in terms of the organizational practice. But I think, I think it's um, you know, pretty false to claim that the internet, has, as long as it's been social, has been without norms about interaction with each other and governance. In fact, I would say it's always been present. The difference that I saw starting in 2010 and going on uh, resides in the nature of the scale, in the nature of volume, in the nature of speed, and in the nature uh, of the, the commercial ramifications, the financial and economic ramifications of the decisions that are going on, never mind the political. So to, to denote it as commercial content moderation is to differentiate it between these other forms uh, that I would argue have always gone on. But I, I might just um, call it 
content moderation or moderation or other kinds of words going forward. But no, that's what I'm talking about here unless I specify otherwise. So I got really interested in, in learning more about what people who were sitting in this intermediary position were being called upon to do. And as you can imagine, as I started looking for information about it, uh, it was really hard to find, right? Um, the major platforms didn't actually throw open their doors to me and ask me to come by and just hang out. Uh, that's not really what happened. Uh, again, a, a young researcher, I would have hoped that that would have happened, but I think it worked out better in the end. So I looked for evidence in other places. This is a screenshot from YouTube from some years ago. Uh, this is probably maybe 2014 at this point, and I like to keep this around because you probably recognize it as an interface that you as a user would encounter on YouTube if you yourself had viewed something that you felt was inappropriate for whatever reason that you may want to report. And so you would go into this series of, of um, drop-down menus uh, and, and sort of triage the material on your end. Right? And this would set off this, uh, this process of review basically on the other side of the screen. Uh, but from your perspective as a user, you don't necessarily know what happens after you kind of do this. But you can see um, from these kinds of drop-down menus and other kinds of reporting tools, this is what I would do. I'd go out and collect just to find out what is it likely that the people on the other side are seeing. Well, a good way to know that is to see what can you actually report. You could report things like adults fighting, minors fighting, shocking or disgusting content, gross out material, blood and gore, war zone footage, um, gratuitous violence, crimes, hate speech. Oh, now it starts getting more complicated, right? A little dicey, or what does that mean on this platform, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but as I sort of um, pondered this, it became clear to me that uh, for whatever, uh, whatever basically, uh, hole, for lack of a better term, that a platform opened up and asked users to fill with UGC. There was an equal and commensurate, at least, liability that was being introduced by doing that. Uh, perhaps not legally, but certainly from a brand management perspective. And we think about that so many of these mainstream platforms have as their revenue generation model uh, an advertising model, where they have to actually manage relationships with advertisers. What is actually flowing over their uh, their branded platform and what ends up next to a particular advertiser's product really matters. So, of course, it stood to reason that they were absolutely not going to just cede control to that to, uh, you know, to the winds or whatever, uh, to the algorithm, <laughs> to the oak table, um, or to users. Uh, of course, they were going to uh, figure out a system to keep control. Uh, so, what were these moderators adjudicating for? Well, um, they were basically, especially in these early days, largely relying on this reactive model where the people on the platform users, uh, typically lay users, would uh, report out something and they would respond to the report and sort of decide, um, does this rise to uh, our own internal standard of what constitutes, say, animal abuse, yes or no. They have internal mechanisms to, to really get specific about that that wouldn't necessarily be available to users, usually because um, the claim was made that if users knew expressly where the line was, they would endeavor to game it and get just as close as they could without crossing it. I think that's probably a pretty legitimate fear. Um, but what these uh, content, commercial content moderators were doing was, in many cases, removing things that could upset or disturb a particular user um, or maybe contravened a, a legal norm in a particular place. But fundamentally, first and foremost, it was clear to me that what they were doing was in the service of the brand management of the platform. And the rules and norms were coming from the platform itself. Uh, so I think that's an important thing to think about. And of course, each particular platform or firm was coming up with its own rules. And what this started 
to do was create a certain market differentiation, right? So that certain platforms got to be known as being more, and sometimes notoriously known, as being more of a safe haven for certain types of material, whereas others were less tolerant of other types. And then, of course, we have the 4chans and 8chans of the world that just exist to post whatever the hell, right? And that's just kind of like completely outside the scope of this talk, but that's sort of at the other end of the extreme, right? Um, it was clear to me also that, uh, in fact, this had to be a highly organized, routinized kind of set of activities uh, in order for it to work. Because one of the things that it seemed to me they were trying to do with this, um, with this human-based commercial content moderation was to, frankly, leave as little a trace as possible of that human intervention, right? If we think back where we were in, in sort of these... Um, you know, frankly, halcyon days of, of uh, the platforms when they were on the rise, it was really about selling a relationship to us as users of user to platform to world. Back in the day, back and forth, on and off, YouTube has had the slogan, anybody? Broadcast yourself, right? It's not broadcast yourself to some dude who's working in a warehouse in Iowa and then he'll decide, and then you can broadcast the world. No, it's broadcast yourself to the world, right? So these, um, these commercial content moderators were required to have this really deep expertise about the platform, about its, uh, its basically its flavor, and then um, to kind of get in and get out without leaving any particular trace that they were there. How would you know that uh, material had been removed? Well, you'd probably only know if you were the one who posted it, right? But for the average user, in this sea of content, and, and how much content am I talking about? Well, this was 2015, YouTube again. Uh, you probably wouldn't notice an absence. So what happened with this phenomenon is that it started to normalize whatever content was there with users in the absence of understanding the ecosystem and understanding the decisions that were being made, just kind of thinking that whatever's there is there for a reason. Maybe it's there because it's the best content. Maybe it's there because the computer vetted it, the computer, whatever that means, right? Um, maybe uh, it's what we all should be looking at or seeing. But for whatever, whatever reason they were sort of coming up with, if they ever stopped it, to think about it, it wasn't because somebody was making decisions behind the scenes. And I would argue that was absolutely the orientation that firms wanted to have, uh, in large part because they didn't want to have to be accountable for their decisions either way, whether it was what they kept up or whether it was what they removed, okay? Um, so this, again, this is a stat. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of the, the scale, I actually don't think I need to give this room that idea, probably, right? But other people don't know this, right? Again, this is an old stat. This is an old public one. I'm sure it's... Um, significantly increased since 2015, and, and it used to be when I first would look up this stat, it was 100 hours uh, back in like 2013, 2014, and I would always have to look at it because I'd always want to say 100 hours per hour per day. No, it's per minute, right? That's how much content is being uh, uploaded. That's just YouTube, so we can multiply that out across all of the mainstream platforms to get a sense of how much material is being produced and circulated. Okay, so this, has anybody seen this before? This particular reporting guide? Um, you know, it's hard to read. I don't really expect you to be able to read it with detail, but what I like to do with that is just show the kind of flowchart logic that is expected of a, kind of a generalist, um, a floor level production, cont commercial content moderator, right? Um, this, yeah, I'm sorry, is this what's doing it? It's driving me crazy too, I didn't know. Thank you. Hold on, everybody. All right, thank you. All right. Um, and uh, y you can see that, um, in fact, what they were being asked to do was quite a complex series of decisions, right? They would, be, they would take a given piece of content and they would be asked to go through and sort of um, evaluate it, although the decisions were often binary, right? A yes or a no. Does, does it have this type of content in it? No, go to the next thing, it's fine. Or yes, it does have this type of content, but what percentage of it, uh, of the image is um, blood, right, versus the rest of it? Or um, what percentage of this, uh, of, of this particular image is um, 
nipple versus something else, right? Okay, so these are the kinds of decisions these folks were making. Um, this was from 2012. And Facebook released this uh, really after the first um, sort of, as far as I know, the first kind of publicized uh, example of workers who were disgruntled doing this work ever came into the press. Uh, and it, it, this was actually a, a situation that was reported out to um, Gawker. Remember Gawker? Pour one out for Gawker. Gawker is gone. But it was reported to Gawker, and, fa and, and there was a little bit of a splash, uh, a little bit of a negative uh, bit of feedback. Facebook created this guide to I guess, clarify uh, the work that was going on behind the scenes. The other interesting thing it did was, um, down here it said locations of user support teams, and it told us that there were um, commercial content moderators working on this in Menlo Park, uh, in Austin, which remains a big center of activity to, to, to this day, in Dublin, as well as in India, not Iowa, right? So here we had already, as of 2012, this kind of global ecosystem that Facebook was developing to cover its, um, its needs on a lot of different vectors. This is important, too, because at this point, um, all of the information, the little information that was trickling out was coming from workers who were basically uh, trying to get in touch with people to publicize their existence. Because, of course, these workers were under NDA. Uh, I'm sure none of you here is under any sort of NDA, right? Yeah, OK. Um, right, we, we're all under NDA, and we can just not talk to each other for the rest of the night. Um, uh, right, I, and part of that is, is cult it's cultural in the Valley. Like, you basically have to sign an NDA every time you turn around. I was going to get on the phone with a guy one time, and he's like, you have to sign an NDA. And I was like, I'm not. Dude, I'm not doing that. And he's like, it's just my company. Can you just do it? Anyway, I didn't, and nobody died, and it was fine. Um, but in this case, um, the workers who were doing commercial content moderation, I mean, they took it seriously, right? So uh, the information that was coming out was, in, in essence, a form of whistleblowing, right? Or it was a form of, of, of revealing an existence of the workers when the companies up to that point weren't really admitting that this pool of workers existed. And the only traces you were finding were these, like, fissures. If you were looking, you'd find it if you found a website of a third-party company that was offering the, these practices. Or you'd find it if you really kind of thought through, where is the tech right now versus, like, the triaging I'm doing of reporting? Uh, those were the ways you'd find find the traces, but the companies themselves were really loath to talk about it. Um, and yet, even by 2012, this work was, if you talk to anybody who was close to it in a particular firm, they would tell you that it was essential, it was mission critical work uh, in terms of the production cycle of the, of the social media that they were generating. Although it was the case that these workers could be working in a building with a bunch of maybe software engineers who didn't even know they were there. Um, so that leads me to the next, uh, the next kind of insight I had along the way as I was uh, looking to talk to these workers. Uh, as I told you, the first encounter I had with understanding that they existed was through Calaris. And Calaris, obviously in the middle of Iowa, it's not located in the Bay, it's not located in Silicon Valley, it's not a major firm that anyone had ever heard of, right? Uh, which, which led me to realize that uh, there was probably something of a fractured uh, structure to how companies were meeting their labor demands in the area of commercial content moderation. And so this is what I found as I was doing the work, that we had, obviously down here in the, th the third kind of register, we have call center workers, and that would be the Calaris folks, like third-party firms um, who, are, who are contracting with, uh, with other firms who need content moderation services, but for whatever reason can't meet that need or don't want to meet that need internally. But we had a whole host of people who were working on site and in-house at these firms. Um, people who maybe lived in San Francisco and take the bus every day and go down to Mountain View, for example, and work there, uh, but who would joke with me sort of in this like pretty dark humor, yeah, we, we go to the HQ every day, but we have the wrong color badge. Like, we don't get free sushi. We can't use the climbing wall. Also, we don't have health insurance. So, right, like some of those more serious than others, but maybe um, the first two kind of denoting uh, a differential status. 
We had boutique firms that I started discovering that were offering services, um, really a specialized set of services, again, to companies that weren't really in the tech space but still had a need to be online. Uh, these were a lot of times like, almost like ad agencies. In fact, many of them have been swallowed up by ad agencies now, um, but some of them stand alone uh, to this day. And not only would they offer moderation services, but they would off also offer other services. For example, there was one case of a, of a boutique firm that had a, a client who was a cookie company. And this particular cookie company, um, you know, had a Facebook page. And they opened up their Facebook page, they put their cookie on the page, and they just like opened it up, and then like the first comments were like, um, kill the gays, Obama's a Muslim, right? Or whatever, you know, some, some iteration thereof. That was not kind of what they wanted associated with their brand, right? So they had this, this boutique from go in and delete all that crap, right? Guess what happened after they deleted all those kinds of comments? tumbleweeds rolling through because weirdly a lot of people weren't like wanting to engage with the cookie company's Facebook page. So their boutique firm went back in, came in under some assumed name. Oh man, we love this crispy chocolatey cookie. It's our favorite cookie in our family. You, everybody should get this cookie. Yeah, they were seeding content at, at the same time as they were deleting it. And that's kind of what uh, made it more like an advertising firm in a way. Of course, they weren't re revealing uh, their, uh, their um, actual identity either in this case. And then finally, I'm gonna gesture at the micro labor uh, sites of the world that were also providing labor to this massive uh, and growing need of UGC adjudication. And if we go back to this uh, case here that I was talking about in 2012, the workers who were complaining about their working conditions to Gawker at that time were actually coming through, uh, I think they were coming from Odesk at the time, which again, that's like 12 iterations of names ago, but Odesk, Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, Upwork, all of these companies that would uh, offer essentially digital piecework, uh, were offering uh, commercial content moderation tasks on their sites as well. That meant that you could be anywhere in the world and do this work, although you would likely ne not necessarily know the firm for, for whom you were doing the work, but the smart users could figure it out, but you wouldn't officially know, and that firm would really never acknowledge your existence either, and you'd come together for maybe one or two or ten or however many tasks, you kind of disappear from each other. That, that was the relationship, no relationship at all, right? And what I discovered through the course of my research was that many of these big firms had such a desperate need, had such a labor need, uh, had such a need for adjudication of content because of the scale that I was talking about before, that they were using a patchwork of all of these of all of these kinds of um, sourcing for their labor, and maybe in some cases even specialized, right? Like they needed a particular campaign, they'd get a boutique firm on it, right? Or they had some really generalist work, okay, that we can farm out to a micro labor website. Um, but you know, our mainstream bread and butter, we'll have a crew in-house, but they're gonna come through a third party uh, outsourcing company, even though they sit at the desk here in, in Mountain View. Um, and that brings me to Megatech. Megatech, you guys, it's not the real name of the company. Um, you might be like, I don't think I know a company called Megatech in the, in the valley. Some guy was in the audience once and he was like, that's actually the name of a trucking company. I was like, okay, that's not the one I'm talking about. This Megatech is a major uh, Silicon Valley headquartered firm that has many properties and brands uh, and platforms under its umbrella. And I have a feeling that many of you know it and work for it um, or use it. Um, Megatech had a set of in-house workers. Uh, those workers were young people around 24, 25 years old. They were uh, graduates of four-year universities, typically elite universities. So they're coming from places like uh, Cal. They were coming from small liberal arts colleges. They were coming from USC other places you, you've assuredly heard of. Unfortunately for them, they, like me, had made bad life decisions, so they had you know, degrees in econ, history, literature, other useless right, disciplines. Um, that's a joke because I don't think they're useless at all, but they are not valued or prized, uh, per se, by industry. Maybe a little bit more so now, but certainly not at this time. And guess what else they were graduating with? Mountains of student loan debt, right? Because this is the USA and we like to um, 
strap our young, uh, young, young people uh, with uh, crippling debt. And so these folks were certainly experiencing that. They were coming out of a kind of an economic downturn when I encountered them. And the idea when it was offered to them of going to work in Silicon Valley in, one of, in megatech was a thing that you could tell your folks about and be proud about. You could feel like you were part of the new economy. It seemed like all of US domestic economic policy was geared at shoring up this sector. Um, you know, they would tell me it sure beats being a barista, which is what I'm doing right now, or delivering pizzas, or I'm living with my parents and I really want to move out of Southern California and go back north. For all of those reasons, even though when they saw the job ad, and it was very nebulous about what their duties would be, they thought, let me go try and get that job. And it wasn't until they were uh, sort of through the interview process that they came to know that um, the job was, in fact, commercial content moderation, something none of them had ever heard of before they went for the job, but that it might expose them to the kinds of content that I showed you from a user view. Uh, we see maybe very rarely, but they would be on the receiving end of, right? So they were sort of already in it by the time that they got the details. And uh, for the ones that I spoke to who were at different, um, you know, kind of at different positions in their, in their tenure with Megatech, it was too alluring. It was, it was like, this is the way I can get my foot in the door and move up in the tech, uh, in the tech space. Um, yeah, so I'll tell you just an anecdote. I, I, I was talking earlier uh, with Christy about it. Um, I've met a lot of people over the years from industry, and uh, you know we've had candid talks sometimes, sort of like uh, off the record talks, and maybe over drinks sometimes they'll come over and they'll say, <laughs> "You know, I know our company is megatech. Our firm is megatech, isn't it?" And I can't tell them, but the fact that maybe like five different firms <laughs> have come to me and assured me that they know that I'm talking about their company just underscores that everybody in the industry at this, you know, at these, this kind of like 2010 and on, we're dealing with this issue, right? Um, so yeah, I can't tell you who it is because uh, in, in, in the course of being able to obtain these stories, of course, I, I promised uh, the workers who were violating NDA that I would withhold that information and I would use pseudonyms. So anytime in the book you're reading people's like names and a company that you've sounds fake, it's because it is, uh, and it's a stand-in. Um, so these workers, when they, when they got the job at Megatech, they felt lucky, they felt like maybe they were gonna get out of the service industry and have this chance to maybe move up in the company, but what turned out happening was that they came through this, um, this contracting firm. There was actually three firms sourcing uh, at the time, at least, and uh, what ended up happening was that they were allowed to be on, um, on the floor for a year, and then they had to take a pause, and then they get re-upped for another year, and that was it. So rather than it being a, a foot in the door, it was actually a revolving door, and after a maximum of two years, in almost every single case, they found themselves back on the street uh, looking for their next job in tech. Uh, and feeling, in many cases, somewhat stigmatized by having done commercial content moderation as, to as opposed to something that was more recognizable or maybe considered uh, more technical or uh, just more sophisticated, right? And uh, so I talked to these workers. Max Breen um, was the first guy I talked to, and he, had, he was done with his, basically, with his tour or his, his time. And, uh, you know, he assured me that he could handle the work. Um, there were people who came on the job with him when he was hired who kind of flamed out after a couple weeks because they started getting exposed to the content and they couldn't take it. But Max said, you know, I can do it, I can take it. Uh, there's really no deleterious effects for me. But then he would say stuff like this to me. Um, I can't imagine anyone who does this job is able to just walk out at the end of their shift and just be, be done. You dwell on it whether you want to or not. Um, his colleague, Josh Santos, was also working at Megatech, and he, he said to me, uh, you kind of feel like you spend eight hours just in this hole of filth that you don't really want to bring into the rest of your life. So although the workers verbally were telling me, we're fine, no ill effects, 
no problems through the course of interviews and talking with them as we kind of built trust and they felt like they could reveal more. They were telling me things like, you know, I'm avoiding social situations. Uh, I don't want to go out with my other friends because we talk about work. And if I talk about work, it's like a showstopper. Nobody wants to hear what I'm doing at work. And I sure as hell don't want to tell them. It's gross. It's embarrassing. Um, I don't want to put that on another person. It's a burden I'm willing to take on. Uh, Max even told me uh, at one point, he was like, you know, I've been really drinking a lot since I started this job. That's not, you know, I'm not a psychologist by training, but that is not a good sign of health, right? When you're drinking to con contend with what you're uh, being asked to do at work. Uh, this was a time when the Syrian conflict was particularly hot. And each one of the workers I talked to who was at Megatech, at some point in our conversation revealed to me that that was some of the material that they were finding most difficult to deal with. I never asked anyone in the course of the nine years that I've been doing this research, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? Because here's the thing, whatever you yourself can imagine is the most horrifying thing that you could ever be exposed to, the thing that would give you nightmares, the thing that would upset you, that's what they're seeing. Their, their boogeyman, their bad thing, they've seen. Uh, in fact, they've seen things that horrify them that they didn't even know people did to each other or to others, right? And so there was really no reason to ask it because I didn't want to do further harm, but also it would invariably come out in other ways, right? Like they would talk to me about seeing kids um, in peril in, in bombed out parts of Syria, right? And they understood that this material in many cases was being uploaded for advocacy purposes, uh, where people were using me Megatech's tools as a way to tell the rest of the world what was going on. Uh, at the same time, they had really deep insight into the fact that, for example, and this was something that um, Max, uh, Max and Josh talked about, uh, you know, they would, uh, they had a, a policy group that sat above them, sat above these, these people who actually implemented policy. And they were told by the policy group, if stuff comes in from Syria, leave it up for advocacy. We need to let the world know. It's like a powerful thing. We need to leave it up. And Max said, uh, you know, we get all kinds of footage from other conflict areas in the world that's deemed, it's just as violent and it's deemed inappropriate and we take it down. He made the connection seamlessly. He said, you know, I can't help but notice that our decision about Syria seems to be kind of in line with U.S. foreign policy towards Syria, right? In other words, this um, temporary worker, young man in his 20s, I guess thanks to that liberal arts education, history, political science, um, ethnic studies, all the things that he was exposed to had the sense to understand the political implications of the decisions that were being made um, that he really had no control over, right? So that was a deep insight. Um, let me try to just uh, get us ahead a little bit because where this takes us really, this is just kind of the, the big uh, anecdotal story that I'll give you uh, from Megatech. Uh, but w wherever I looked uh, on the story of commercial content moderation, I found myself confronted with um, the promise of sort of the new, the new society, the new constitution of labor that so many of us uh, came to believe would come to pass, and for many of us may, may have. I mean, I consider myself a knowledge worker. I'm a, a prof professor at the university. I'm also like my own personal travel agent. I'm also good at like pretty, well, actually a pretty rotten accountant reconciling my travel. Like I do it all, right? Uh, but you know, what I don't do is work on a factory line like my grandfather who worked on the same line for 45 years. Uh, I'm not in manufacturing. I'm, I'm using my mind primarily to do my work. And so many of us in, uh, in tech and other kinds of industries are doing that as well. This is, a, this is a great shift that occurred from the mid 20th century in the American context to where we are now, right? Um, it was a series, you know, sociologists and, and, and um, uh, labor scholars and others wrote about this and told us at, very aspirationally that this time would come when we would be able to, usually with the help of machines uh, and datification of, of our society, we would be able to basically be delivered from those dangerous uh, manufacturing environments that made up so much of particularly uh, uh, the, the Rust Belt of the United States and other manufacturing 
hubs, right? Uh, Daniel Bell is a sociologist who was well known for predicting the, what he called the coming of post-industrial society. And he told us, uh, this is back in the early 70s, you know, this would be the rise of the service sector, the engineering or technical class, um, specific, specialized, scientific and technical work would be prized and would be the kind of important work, uh, usually in concert with data, uh, data analysis or engineering uh, that we would focus on and that technological innovation would really drive um, uh, uh, the economy of the United States, right? And uh, that would also lead to all kinds of new potentials for society. Uh, just one of them was this, right? More leisure time. Raise your hand if you think you have more leisure time than, I don't know, people did 20 years ago on the job. Yeah, maybe. Um, I mean, I would argue that that particular part of the promise has actually largely failed in many parts because of the way that the, the very technology that was being invoked as liberatory has actually encroached on things like putting parameters and limits around the workday. Who checks email after you're off the clock, so to speak? Who's never off the clock? Yeah, don't raise your hand. I know who you are, because I know where some of you are from. You're not off, you're not off the clock right now. Um, the other thing that was happening at this time was, uh, you know, a, another set of forces, right? This erstwhile uh, fringe bunch of economists out of the University of Chicago, this you know, nut job named Milton Friedman had this idea about, uh, you know, free society. Anybody see the Chilean folks demonstrating? Next door, guess where Friedman's laboratory was for his economic policies? Anyone know? Chile, 1973. Okay. Thank you, history class in the university. Um, deregulation, privatization, austerity, uh, 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 divestment of the state, right, from, from the public sector. These were, not, uh, these were not mainstream ideas in the early and mid-70s. And yet, by the time we saw Reagan, Thatcher, and others uh, come along in the early 80s through to now, these are taken as a given, almost, right? That these things are good. So that combined with the rise of the knowledge sector is actually, I would argue, let us more like to here than the swimming pool. The uberization of society, the gig gigification of society, the uh, liftification of society, the bird scooter, for God's sake, ification of society, right? Um, disrupted work life. I don't know about you, I don't like being disrupted personally. I'd rather, I, I didn't ask for that. But yeah, there's a lot of disruption. What's happening in terms of that? Well, I mean, I'm in the belly of the beast. Should I just go for it? I'll tell you what I think is happening, right? Workers into precarious contractors. Everybody's contracting all the time. What does it mean to be a full-time employee anymore with benefits? Anybody here have a pension? <laughs> I just, yeah, right. Like we got what, uh, maybe state of California employee. You don't have to say, but it's rarer and rarer, right? Um, that was that's a thing of the past, right? If you're a contractor, you don't really work for that company anyway. What do they owe you? Deregulation schemes or or uh, regulation avoidant philosophies in the first place, right? The firms know better anyway. They'll take care of it. They'll dictate to government what those regulations or lack thereof should be, not the other way around. Tax avoidance. How many of the firms that run this city love to pay taxes? That's what I, thank you for the laugh in the front here. You're my ringer, right. Uh, other kinds, all sorts of disruption. All sorts of disruption that I don't think has necessarily been great uh, for the masses, right? Uh, I think that commercial content moderation actually has many of these characteristics, especially as we see it, if you think about that chart that I showed you, and we kind of go down, we consider that maybe a, 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 a stratification of its own within, within this, all the way down to uh, digital piecework and mechanical Turk and so on. Um, it, it, really, these, these are the characteristics of that work. Anybody ever seen these buses? <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand again. Maybe you ride them. It's fine. It's fine, no shade, as they say, right? Um, this is a Google bus at, at one of the uh, public bus stops here in San Francisco, and some people doing a demo in front of it, right? Because they're saying, look, this is like public infrastructure. Google's stopping its bus here. 
Um, that, that doesn't make sense. Google doesn't even want to pay taxes in San Francisco, much less um, uh, deal with the infrastructure. But it's not just here that this is happening, right? In fact, these have been enormous geospatial, economic, political reconfigurations all over the place. Uh, this is a picture from the Philippines, Makati City. Do we have any people familiar with the Philippines here at all? A little bit? But this could be downtown San Francisco, could be downtown uh, financial district and just about anywhere. I mean, it's just a huge sk skyscrapers, big transnational companies located there. The thing you need to know about the Philippines is that it has an entire entire uh, ministry dedicated to soliciting foreign work, service work, knowledge work to come to the Philippines because the Philippines has an incredible infrastructure set up of business process outsourcing or call center work. Business process outsourcing is the fancy industry term for call center work, right? And uh, what's going on with commercial content moderation? Well, as I followed this phenomenon, not only did I find it here in the Bay and in Iowa and in Dublin and in Austin, but I kept following its trajectory. And guess what else was happening? The cost of the labor, or in other words, the wages paid to workers kept going down and down and down as I followed the trajectory of this work around the world till I got to places like the Philippines where there was a massive workforce of young people, young educated people available, where there was a culture and a political sort of uh, apparatus oriented towards service work that was being offshored from typically from North America but from Europe as well and where everything was sort of set up to perfectly receive that work infrastructurally and otherwise. In fact, this is what PESA said, and, and tactical tech folks will like this. If, here's another great place to find out what's going on. Find a slide deck that somebody put on the internet and save that. This is PESA's uh, slide deck. Industrial peace and PESA economic zones, only three strikes in nine years. Right? Does that, does that sound like a good thing for the workers? Probably not, but you want to um, cite your offshore labor pool there? Good for you. It's going to be seamless, friction-free, right? No disruption there. Uh, this is a, uh, the, basically what has happened in places like Manila is that, um, you know, the money has flowed in and out, but it's been very uneven, and it's flowed into these special economic zones that they've set up, they call them eco-zones there, uh, with all of these dispensations for, um, for taxes, again, you don't have to pay taxes, there's all this infrastructure that's developed, but just expressly for that eco-zone, and you have really, really uneven economic and infrastructural development. So you have places that look like this, um, this is a place, by the way, called Bonifacio Global City, um, BGC. This used to be known. This is like you can see high class shopping, uh, entertainment, uh, residential, as well as all the office towers in the back. Uh, this used to be known as Fort McKinley. This used to be where the US military had its headquarters when it occupied the Philippines for a century, right? And uh, after, uh, after the US military vacated, uh, this is where the Filipino army had its base. Uh, but now it's been turned into this uh, high-end shopping district, and there are commercial content moderation outsourcing firms located here. And so you'll have areas like this in Manila located pretty close to areas like this. I call this the paperless office, by the way. All right, this is where tech goes to die. Now, let me tell you, I don't want to exotify the Philippines as some sort of um, unusual other where uh, this kind of unevenness, economic unevenness takes place solely. I live in Los Angeles, all right? I want to get started about what I see on a daily basis in my commute from where I live to UCLA. I got lost in Bel Air once. I thought they were going to pick me up just for like being in the neighborhood and you know, my car wasn't nice enough, like whoop, whoop, pull over. Um, so it's not just the Philippines, but this is an extreme example, right? In so many ways. Um, uh, and here, uh, this is a, another a place there called Eastwood City. This was actually the first IT-specific eco-zone. And you can see it, it almost looks like Disney, right? It looks a little bit like Disney, kind of like that Facebook campus that was designed by the guy who did California Adventure. It looks very similar, right? It's got shopping, it's got eateries, uh, it's got everything you need. You actually can go there and never leave. Um, if you were, were so inclined. And it's got you know, 24 by seven uninterrupted power. It's got high speed internet, it's got its own security, uh, and it's, it's really its own little fiefdom, right? 
and of course, you, you get a tax holiday if you, if you uh, put your business there. So you'll find IBM, Citibank, and others there. One of the things I came across in my research was this map from the 20s of trade routes to and from the Philippines, and I was startled by it because, again, this is 1923. You can see those routes. I bet if we were to overlay a map of undersea cables uh, going around the world transmitting data, it would look very similar, right? Or if we think about just the flows of labor as they're coming from places like the West Coast of the United States going in and out of the Philippines. Um, these routes are really contemporary in so many ways, right? And they're predicated uh, on these colonial relationships, these long-standing relationships. But it's not just the routes. It's actually the ways in which these firms solicit North American clients. This is microsourcing. This is one of the companies based, um, or it has one of its outposts in uh, Bonifacio Global City. And they tell us, again, screenshots, you guys. They tell us again, they tell us here, um, Filipinos have excellent language skills, understand Western slang, and have a great eye for detail. All Filipino people have a great eye for detail, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, making them perfectly suited for content moderation work. So it doesn't really go into detail about like, why Filipino people might have a particular uh, familiarity with North American English slang, right? But um, they're on offer. They also offer here at Microsourcing Virtual Captives, which is an offshore team, uh, not necessarily just for uh, uh, commercial content moderation, but for coding and other kinds of um, uh, knowledge work uh, in the IT sector that you can build up very quickly and tear down just as, as quickly. Uh, so there's really no intrinsic relationship from the firm that solicits it. Uh, and you can and you can really get in and get out very quickly, and that's that's what's on offer. To kind of wrap it uh, in the Philippines, but also elsewhere, but certainly uh, uh, very visibly so. We've got intertwined systems that are supporting such an ecosystem and um, entire logics that have been developed to support the need for the kind of labor that, uh, that co commercial content moderation demands, right? Uh, that might be state and governmental policy regimes, it, physical infrastructure, labor availability, um, the, the types of preparation and expectations of the labor pool, uh, laws and norms governing labor activity, uh, and all sorts of other things. And what I found in the Philippines when I talked to workers who were doing commercial content moderation there is that, in fact, they shared a lot of similarities with their North American counterparts. They were young people. They were sophisticated urbanites. Uh, many of them had uh, family responsibilities to uh, people other than themselves, so they might have been uh, making money on behalf of, of parents or siblings as well, um, but they felt deeply precarious and insecure because of their contract-based work. Guess where they were deathly afraid of their contracts going? Anyone? What? Malaysia? Yeah, that's a good guess. You've heard, you've heard this place mentioned before. Iowa. <laughs> no, they were afraid of India. They would have been afraid of Iowa if I'd told them about it, but I left it. Yeah, they were worried about India. And India was used as like this disciplinary specter, right? Uh, hey, if, if, you guys, if you guys don't hurry up, we're going to lose the contract. We're going to get underbid. So instead of having 32 seconds to make your content moderation decision, you can have 15. There's metrics. There's productivity metrics that you have to meet. Uh, and if you don't, the, the, the contract will go. And this is the kind of thing they were told. Well, if you have 32 seconds to work on one piece of content and then you only have 10 to 15, effectively your productivity metric has been doubled, right? Or another way to look at it is your wage has been halved. And this was happening over and over again to them. So they were, um, you know, they were being disciplined by these kinds of global mappings of this, of this labor and its transitory nature and the way that it could be uh, moved around. Uh, and it seemed that in many cases it actually was circulating in that way. It wasn't just a specter, although uh, for whatever reason, India was something invoked by people I talked to in every single case. And you'll see that again and again in the book. All right, what is at stake? I mean, we could go on all day about what's at stake, but these are just a few thoughts to, um, you know, to give you uh, food for thought. Uh, I would argue commercial content moderation is a central and mission critical activity in the workflow of social media, but it is often low status, low wage. It's often little known. It's more and more known now, but still, um, it's, it's not, it doesn't hold any kind of prominent position. It reflects and relies upon new problematic labor forms. I hope that I've convinced you of that. Um, it's globalized, outsourced, and precarious in many cases. 
Uh, it can put workers in dangerous and difficult situations. It's not the same, of course, as losing a finger in an iPhone or um, working on a production line in an auto factory. Uh, those things still go on, and those have been moved out of sight and out of mind from North American view in large part. But of course, we can, as we think about commercial content moderation and its psychic kind of damage, we can start thinking about the other places in the production chain that have been rendered invisible too, whether it's on the um, uh, sourcing of minerals from the earth, whether it's the building of uh, machines that we use to be in ubiquitous computing and in the cloud, and yet they're totally material, or whether it's in e-waste. So there are people all along the chain uh, that have a similar story but may even be in physical danger. These workers are typically in another kind of danger, uh, one that we're just coming to grips with. And um, in many cases, when these workers are considered or imagined at all, their work is just typically thought of as being automated. And we do know that in 2019, the big firms, the ones uh, uh, headquartered uh, south of here that have the, the, the prowess, the engineering prowess and acumen, that have the money to throw at the problem, um, that, that have those abilities, have made incredible innovations in the ways that automation can take place. But one of the phenomena, one of the unexpected phenomena anyway that I've seen is that now proactive moderation will go out and cull a bunch of potentially known, uh, suspected bad content, some of which maybe will never have been viewed. It will have just been hanging out there, but the, the, uh, the tool will detect it and it will cull it and now that material maybe has to be vetted still by a human moderator. So does that actually decrease the need for moderation? No, it actually increases it. So what we're seeing too is this new phenomenon of all these new specialized forms of content moderation going on. And then finally, last but probably not least, it troubles the notion of the internet as a fundamentally free speech zone because we know that there are people in the mix making decisions about what can go up and go down. I would say that this is a key kind of conversation we have to have, if for no other reason than um, the firms themselves have gotten the buy-in of a quarter of the world's populace on the terms of uh, giving us all a, a chance for democratic engagement that I would say is really maybe a, a, a different kind of bargain than we thought at first, right? What are these firms anyway? Um, they'll tell you this, they're not a media company, right? Not media, whatever we are, we're not media companies. Is that just an existential question or crisis for them? No. By the way, the, the, that's, um, uh, oh, what's that dude's name? Harvey, uh, huh? Keitel, Harvey Keitel, thank you. Yeah holding a Facebook mic at like a red carpet, right? I was at Sundance a couple years ago. Uh, you can rent all those storefronts there. I saw Amazon, YouTube, Google, you know, they were the same, Apple, uh, Dropbox, at the premier media event, right? All the tech firms were there. So they're not tech, they're not media companies. Why don't they want you to say that? Well, in part, because we know what happens to media companies. Media companies are subject to all kinds of rules and regulations. Uh, George Carlin made a very famous career out of lampooning what those are, right? Um, and instead, uh, where they sit now, of course, in this, again, the American context, CDA 230, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is what gives firms that consider themselves or, 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 or identify them as, as these internet intermediaries the right to both remove content as they see fit, but also make the decision to leave content up, right? This is a law that there was just a big, did anybody see the, um, the uh, House subcommittee hearing on this the other day? You guys actually had better things to do? That's weird, because I was watching it at like 7 a.m. Um, this is, a, this is, a, 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 this is a, a norm that is increasingly being questioned in the United States, but the important thing to know is that it is an American law that should really only apply here, and yet, these firms have bundled up American norms towards all sorts of things, not just American norms, but the particular viewpoint of Silicon Valley into policies and into functionality and into architecture and coded the world with it. More and more that is not working. And you can fall wherever you do on that, but states are enacting and demanding that their own uh, laws be respected. Uh, with regard to content. So we've got this mouthful, I don't know if any of you speak German, I can't say that, Netz DG, uh, that, that says that um, 
platforms of greater than 2 million users have to take content down within a very short window of time that violates German law or be fined. Uh, what that means is there are all kinds of Germany-specific content moderation activities going on and centers going on in Germany to meet this law. You may feel how you do about this. German, German people maybe feel they have a very particular reason to have strong hate speech laws that they want enacted. On the other hand, my Berlin-based friend, you may know a lot of people in Germany who feel this is a terrible law and resist it. Uh, we might think about, you know, we might think maybe that's a good law, but what about when Turkey says you have to, uh, you, you have to follow our local law and we say that Kurdish people are terrorists. All Kurds are terrorists and you can't have anything about Kurdish people on the platform. Now what do you do, right? Then we've got this gal over at YouTube. This is CEO of YouTube. She's telling us that platforms are libraries. Now, this is the one that gets me apoplectic because I actually train future librarians in my other part of my job. So what is YouTube missing if, if it's a library? Well, librarians comes to mind. Uh, I had a librarian say to me, YouTube's a library in the same way a pile of unsorted crap on my floor is an archive. That's not it. So, what, so to me, it's interesting, like, why is she trying to capitalize on that notion? What is it about a library in the American context, particularly, that invokes an affective relationship that's very positive, right? Um, I wish she'd get that out of her mouth, you know? But anyway, she, she keeps saying it all the time. I'm told that at YouTube they say this all the time in-house. Um, uh, I don't know what they're doing in terms of their dedication to the public good or, uh, you know, thinking about how their um, recommendation algorithm really differs from the idea of a library, right? What else is going on? Last couple things. Well, we know this. This is the new trend. Like I said, rather than see a lessening of people involved in commercial content moderation, especially as new tools come online to, to do automated work, uh, we're seeing more and more people hire, hired, and we're seeing more specificity in terms of what they're, they're working on. So they may, may be uh, regional specialists or, or specialists in a particular language, or they may be working on a particular issue or hotspot. Also back to YouTube, the, uh, they came out uh, about a year, a little more than a year ago, saying that they were going to limit their workers to four hours of disturbing content per day. But there was no talk of, of lessening the fire hose of UGC. So does that mean that they're just going to look at half the amount of content? Does that mean that they're going to double how many people are working? Like, there was no explanation there. Maybe, again, aspirationally, the idea was that they were going to bring on enough automated tools to make up the difference. But in the realm of commercial content moderation, automated tools continue to be so aspirational. And we know that when everything's a nail, you know, um, you're always going to try to apply that technological hammer to the, to, to the solution, right? Uh, so, of course, industry is going to build computational tools to deal with um, the bad behavior of human nature and the desire to circulate content and even the economic incentive to do it, right? Rather than look at maybe their business model or look at other issues going on. Um, I'm going to close with this, this slide. This is back in the Philippines in uh, the Eastwood City uh, IT eco zone that I showed you before. It looked a bit like Disney. And I visited this statue. It's hard to see, but I'll tell you wh what, what it is. And it, there's a picture of it in the book, and you can look online, too, and find it. There are three figures in this statue, and each one is wearing a headset, kind of like this one, right? You know, one of them is sitting at a computer. One of them is on the go with a briefcase. And then there's this lady with a f set of files. And in the back, you can see a Uniqlo, and you can see a coffee bean and tea leaf. So and it's all these kind of um, tip, typical mall stores around. So I was in this area, and I was taking all these pictures of the statue. All these Manila residents were walking around, um, kind of milling about shopping, hanging out in the area, watching me like, does she know we have uh, art museums in Manila? That's not Filipino art. Like, what are you, why are you taking a picture of that weird corporate statue? But there's this plaque on the bottom of the statue, and I want to I just read to you what it says, um, because it tells you something about how the Philippines views all of the people it has working in this, in this, um, in this service industry dedicated to the knowledge work that, that the logic of social media has created. It says, this sculpture is dedicated to the men and women that have found purpose and passion in the business process outsourcing industry. Their commitment to service is the lifeblood of Eastwood City, the birth birthplace of BPO in the Philippines. 
Uh, Eastwood City was declared under presidential proclamation number 191 as the Philippines' first special economic zone dedicated to information technology, Eastwood City's modern heroes. So the goal of my work um, is to highlight all of the people who are doing this kind of unheralded, unseen, and disregarded work. Uh, so as they say it, the rest of us can be on the internet. And uh, I, I hope that I've convinced you that what they're doing is essential and important and worthy of discussion. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. <laughs>